Earlier in this series on Revelation, I bypassed one of the lessons. I call it Caution Required. It was about the interpretation of Revelation, speaking about the different schools of interpretation, such as the idealist, the futurist, historicist, preterist, etc. I want to come back to this information now and run through it as a bit of an appendix. For some, this might be useful information, although quite dry. I'm going to be reading the lesson as written, so it will sound like it belongs right around lesson four or five. Having now established the evidences for the early dating of Revelation, we're in a better position to understand the book itself. This exploration will not be a commentary or interpretation so much as it will be an analysis of the action and the symbols portrayed. The book itself is too large and too complex to expect to explain it verse by verse in so short a series as this. We should also recall the appeal for caution in our attempt to interpret this book as so many great scholars have warned. Kenneth L. Gentry Jr. makes a note early on in his investigation that so often Christians charge from their very first profession of faith into the book of Revelation and then start informing their friends of their definitive findings about the end of days, an end of days in which we are, in their opinion, no doubt living now. This has also been my experience with new converts. Instead, we need to recall that the book has confounded the greatest intellects and the most spiritual seekers for millennia. Each has disagreed on many points, and we have to be careful not to run ahead of what the Bible says or state our own positions with too much confidence or hubris. One of the great Princetonians, B.B. Warfield, said of Revelation that it is, quote, the most difficult book in the Bible. It has always been the most variously understood, the most arbitrarily interpreted, the most exegetically tortured. This is quoted from Gentry's Before Jerusalem Fell. Owing to this caution, I can appreciate Hank Hanegraaff's approach to Revelation, an approach he says is not to use an interpretive model at all, but rather a method. He calls his the exegetical eschatology. He's attempting not to fit the narrative to his own perspective, but is trying to rely only upon what the Bible says. For this reason, his work is a little frustrating for the prophecy pundit, since you can come to it looking for a definitive referent in history, whether past or future, and he often won't give it. I had that experience with Hanegraaff's writing, and you might just have the same frustration with this study. In a similar way, the church fathers are often just as frustrating to me when I look at them for proof texts on various subjects, because rather than speculate or expand upon what the Bible says, they often just quote it or rephrase it. Whatever ambiguity you found in the inspired text, you'll often find in the church fathers. Luther commends this attempt as well. He taught that you must only believe about God what the Bible tells us to believe, and not speculate, analogize, or reason to our own independent conclusions. Of course, each of these scholars violates their own principle at certain points and has erred in some points. Our sin has affected our ability to interpret Scripture as it's touched every other aspect of our being. The most popular interpretive grid these days is the Left Behind thesis and its relatives. These are all futurist views, which focus on a literal, terrestrial millennium for Israel with the Christian Church removed from Earth. It combines the premillennial view with a dispensationalist theology. Regarding futurists and dispensationalist methods, Gentry notes that they claim that Revelation is more relevant and more up-to-date with regards to today's events than our own newspapers are. They confidently equate current events to Revelation's accounts, and they assure us that they line up and that the end is near. But they continue to do so decade after decade, adjusting their interpretations as they go, contradicting past theories, and moving the end of history further and further along. Grenville Lewis is quoted in Before Jerusalem Fell, saying that through the centuries this book has been the happy hunting ground of the cranks who believe that its cryptic messages were meant to refer to the events of their own troubled age. William Barclay follows suit in his statement that it has, quote, become the playground of religious eccentrics. The schools of interpretation. The dating of Revelation and the model of interpretation used are closely intertwined. Sometimes being committed to a particular model will require a certain date be assigned to the writing of Revelation. Someone committed to preterism, for instance, will require a date prior to the fall of Jerusalem for the writing of the book. The futurists will require that it be written after that event. Conversely, you may be convinced of the dating first, and then that leads the interpreter to take a new view of the method required. I was convinced of the early date of Revelation, and then saw its prophecies were realized primarily in the first century. 
Bern Poitras's commentary, The Returning King, was used as a reading assignment for the third millennium course on Revelation and provided a good description of the different methods. The following are quotes and paraphrases from that book, The Returning King, and the lesson that was based upon it. Preterists. Preterists think that prophecy fulfillment occurred at the fall of Jerusalem, if Revelation was written in AD 67 to 68, and or the fall of the Roman Empire. Futurists think that fulfillment will occur in a period of final crisis just before the second coming. Historicists think that Revelation 6, 1 through 1824 offers a basically chronological outline of the course of church history from the first century, Revelation 6, 1, until the second coming, Revelation 1911. The idealists think that the scenes of Revelation depict principles of spiritual war, not specific events. These principles are operative throughout the church age, and they may have repeated embodiments. It's not always the case that a middle way is best, but often there is some shared middle ground that can be preferred over 100% exclusivity. In fact, it's impossible to be completely exclusive to any one of the above models, and good teachers like Gentry or Hannah Graff allow that there is a degree of mixture in each of the views. Hannah Graff's reference to his exegetical method is meant to show that he is following the Bible, regardless of a model, and is not trying to fit the interpretation into a preconceived schema. Of course, that's the goal and the claim of all the interpreters, but for Hannah Graff, it allows for both past and future fulfillments. Bern Poitras consciously embraces thoughts from each model as well. Because it seems inevitable that there will be such overlap, I also embrace this from the outset. Poitras calls this approach an integrated strategy, which is multifaceted and includes multiple embodiments. He shows that in some ways each view applies and that we should always see three applications, to the first century church, to the final conflict, and to our present day. Kenneth Gentry would agree, but would stress that there is one interpretation and then multiple applications. In the Mintz Hermeneutics course, we learned this about all of scripture. A passage has one meaning, but various applications. From the third millennium course, Poitras' lesson again says, the major symbols of Revelation represent a repeated pattern. This pattern has a realization in the first century situation of the seven churches. It also has an embodiment in the final crisis, and it has an embodiment now. We pay special attention to the embodiment now because we must apply the lessons of Revelation to where we are. The description of these views and the millennium especially are essentially uniform across all the Revelation studies that I've seen to this point, so I'm not going to try to restate them in my own words, but I'll just bullet what the third millennium course says on the views of the millennium. First, historic premillennialism. The premillennial view held during the church's history. To quote the third millennium study, this view understands Revelation 20 to follow chronologically after chapter 19. Jesus returns and he binds Satan. Believers are resurrected to rule 1,000 years with Jesus on earth. Unbelievers are not. People live a long time during the millennium and then they die. As unbelievers will be born during this time, they are evangelized during this period. The second would be dispensational premillennialism. This view arose in the 1830s and it's basically Darby's view. At the onset of the millennium, Jesus returns and he restores the nation of Israel. Jesus rules on earth from his throne in Jerusalem, and at this point the church has been raptured and God is dealing again with Israel. He's not dealing with the church. The two are separate entities at all times. Postmillennialism. The millennium is possibly, but not necessarily, all of the intervening period between the advents, just as it is in all millennialism. For many, though, the millennium is more likely a literal thousand-year period right before Jesus' return. The kingdom is necessarily expanding and things are getting better as the reign increases. All millennialism. As the name implies, there is no millennium. This view believes that there is not a literal thousand year period. The kingdom is ruled by Jesus in heaven right now through church history. He will return at the end of this thousand years. Blessings and tribulation continue throughout the era. All millennialism differs from postmillennialism in that they don't see the golden age of the church's dominion occurring during this period and prior to Christ's return. Most studies and books on Revelation also analyze the strengths and the weaknesses of each of these different models of interpretation. The Third Millennium Course and Gentry's book, Navigating the Book of Revelation, 
have a very similar section and are largely in agreement. Likewise, the Paul Blackham book-by-book -book study on Revelation has a very similar section describing the views. At this point, discussing the strengths and weaknesses, I'll opt out of using the third millennium analysis here, as it presented the following take on the weaknesses of preterism. Having responded to it, I'll instead use Gentry's comments. Except for the following, they're very similar. Speaking first of preterism, it does not recognize the future aspect of the return and other prophecies. It force fits some prophecies into the past. It can even deny a future resurrection, although most recognize the future return of Christ. Preterism can deny that there is a future element in most apocalyptic literature. It is too limiting on the meaning behind terms like it is near. It does not acknowledge the contingency of certain prophecies. Quoting the third millennium revelation course, preterism has little to say about the development of God's kingdom since the first century. It doesn't prepare Christians throughout history, end quote. I fully expect that any proponent of any of the models would disagree with the perceived weaknesses that others attribute to their model. I certainly don't agree with this assessment above of preterism, and neither would the preterists I've read, like Gentry or Sproul. Hanegraaff holds to most of their interpretations, but he refuses to call himself a preterist, and it's likely that he does so by presuming upon it the weaknesses listed here. As I dispute the assessment here by third millennium, I would say they've lumped a kind of hyper-preterism in with preterism. This gives me some warning myself when I critique the views of others. The preterists discussed above, R.C. Sproul, Kenneth L. Gentry Jr., and Brian Godawa, for instance, would not at all reject Christ's future return, nor do they underemphasize it. For this reason, some people will call them partial preterists rather than preterists. What they're saying is that the tribulations of first century Israel do not accompany the second advent in the future, nor do they neglect the historical development of the church. The lessons of revelation regarding perseverance and persecution remain vital. And rather than silence on this development, the preterist is the one interpreter who sees the kingdom developing like the leaven in the bread. Church development is so important on this view that the millennium is seen to be a part of the ever-improving and growing church in history. Like Hank Hanegraaff, Kenneth Gentry has also distanced himself from the term preterist in some of his more recent writing. Very often we find that labels can become too restrictive and too loaded with meaning. Gentry says in Navigating the Book of Revelation, quote, I now call my view redemptive historical preterism to emphasize the story of scripture rather than merely the mundane history of the era.